So I left everything, my girlfriend, all my, you know, all my family, and I was like, I'm out, peace, and moved to Queens, and tucked it out in Queens, and then it ended up in Brooklyn, and now I've been in Brooklyn for 20 years now. I actually just got my citizenship this year, so I'm rocking the dual citizenship. So yeah, my journey to New York was everything in terms of establishing myself uh, in the underground scene and still having a career today, I firmly believe that happened because I left the Toronto scene. Because back then, uh, it was much smaller. We had incredible artists, but you know there was no Drake, there was no Weekend, none of that was happening. Now Toronto is like a mega, uh, mega bucket culture pot of, of talent that has reached huge international, you know, um, ways. But, but back then it was it was kind of like an underground scene. So I was like, I need to get out of here if I really want to make my mark. And that's that's what it was. Now that's dope. I got a two part question. Then you said East Coast hip hop uh, was what you were listening to, and who were you listening to in Canada? So give me those two. Okay, great question. Um, so if we're talking about New York hip hop, I mean, for me, it all started with Wu Tang Clan, Gangstar. You know, Dos Effects, the Beat Nuts, all the Duck Down crew. Mm. Um, and then I started getting into the then I started getting into the beats, right? So I was like, who's making these beats? And then RZA, um, Q Tip, DJ Premier, these are early guys that made me want to discover how they were making beats and dig into records. Um, and in Toronto, um, my early influences are like, you know, Mike So Fresh West, he was like the big daddy Kane of Canada, shout mm-hmm. to him. You know, of course we had all the guys like Cardinal, Fischel, Socrates, the grassroots, DJ Serious. Um, there was a lot of local talent in Toronto that are still rocking to this day that were big influences on me. So, shout to them. That's dope. That's dope. When you say, okay, I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna ask you a super hard question. Man. This is like hard in, the hip, in, in regards to hip hop. Who's your favorite member of the Wu Tang Clan? I'm gonna put you on the spot. My favorite MC of the Wu Tang Clan. Favorite. Man, that's- yeah, yeah. It's really tough because because I, I really break it down by album. So I'm gonna answer the question, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go a bit more in depth. So my favorite Wu Tang record period um, are Jizza Liquid Swords, uh, yes. the Enter the Space Chamber, the first one, Ghostface first two albums, mm-hmm. and then Ray, Rayquan only felt for Cuban Link. Those are like my if I had to go to an island and take like four or five albums, those are the joints. Mm-hmm. So. I think all the MCs had their moments for me, mm-hmm. um, but if I had to pick one like of all time, I don't know, man. I'm gonna have to go with Jizza, Liquid Swords era. Just he put me in such a vibe on that album and yes. where he was beat wise. If I get locked in with Jizza in that era, um, or shit, any era, even right now would be dope. But yeah, I'm gonna go with Jizza. Okay, and you know what? I, that's a trick question. That's the question. Is just uh, one of those questions that really there is no answer because their whole vibe and their whole right, right. I just want to. I just want to hear. Yeah, I just wanted to hear. I knew. I knew. I've been listening to your work for years, so I knew it would be almost impossible. You did a better job than I ever would have. Shout out to you for that. Uh, now I noticed with your music, it's a you have a melodic vibe, which is is right up my alley. How did you go there? Who are the, uh, who are the producers that influenced you in regards to that? I'm sorry, did you say who are the producers that influenced me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's so many, man. It's, it's so many. As I get older, I've locked into two all-time influences on my sound to this day. Those two producers are Jane Dilla and DJ Premier. Mm. If I look back... If I look at my catalog and making beats to this day, um, and that and this is this changes all the time. Like people ask me my top five. There's others, you know, like uh, RZA, um, Q-Tip, you know, Tribe Called Quest, uh, Midnight Marauders. Like that is the hip hop perfection. That album, top to bottom, mm. on the production side of things for me. But Jay Dilla came along, and while his catalog, unfortunately, due to him passing, which is still a tragedy I feel every day, mm-hmm. um, wasn't as big as some other producers. Influence-wise, Jay Dillon is still influencing people to this day, and not even just hip-hop people. I'm talking about rock people, mm-hmm. soul, jazz. Like, I hear it to this day. Yes. Like, his bounce, his swing, how he writes bass lines. People are still trying to figure him out, and they never will. Me included, by the way. Uh, our huge fans. And so, yeah, Dylan and Primo, 
you know. And then, of course, there's so many man peeps, the beat nuts, the beat miners, uh, Madlib, Alchemist. Um, you know, I'll miss dudes all day if I don't think about Chris Paul. Like, there's so right. many. Right, so many. right. What, you know, being from Canada, how do you, you know, because this is something that's totally foreign to me. How does a kid from Canada grab hold to American hip, you know, the, the United States style, and what drew you to it? The whole culture, I shouldn't say sound. I mean, Toronto was a sponge for anything from New York. So anything from New York or Detroit, we were we were listening and we were, you know, ask, ask all the 90s classic legendary hip hop acts that came through Toronto to do a show. It's some of their most memorable shows. Mm -hmm. The appreciation for, for that type of sound was so big in Toronto. So it was all around me, you know. Plus, you know, we had our own college stations that were repping and playing vinyl mix shows. Mm -hmm in Toronto that was playing all the stuff, you know, the equivalent of like the Searching Bobbito or a halftime show mm -hmm. in New York. We had those in Toronto. So I was getting all my, my daily dose of, of hip hop and learning. And, uh, you know, I didn't, I don't go super far back to the 80s. You know, I wasn't listening to hip hop when, when Eric and, Eric and Rockham or ECMD dropped their first record. I had to go back and do the research when I started mm. getting into the high school. And I was like, I want to know everything. I'm going to build the library and learn and study and uh, I'm still studying to this day, but yeah, man. That's dope, man. It's just amazing because being an American, and you know, I, I think it's almost uh, synonymous with being narrow-minded. We don't think about the rest of the world. We just kind of like early New York hip hop. It was all about New York, and I'm assuming that being, you know, I'm, I'm speaking for myself, but I'm assuming I'm not the only person that was thinking that. You just thinking it's American thing, and then when you start seeing Wu Tang Clan tour and things of that nature, you see how people are loving them, you see how Buckshot and that crew, everybody's loving them, NWA, everybody's loving them. What are some of your your most memorable places to visit that you just felt the love? Uh, I'm, first of all, I just wanted to say that I'm super blessed that I've been able to travel the places that I have been because of music and hip-hop, you know, shout to Master Ace and Soleil and people I toured with, but you know, me and Ace now, that we kind of formed this union, we, we touch a lot of places. Um, it's difficult, man. I've been, I've been Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Colombia, Chile, all of Europe. Like, um, when you were just saying, you know, New York just thinks about itself, it's like, I don't think they ever would have conceived how far it would reach. And now it's like, you know, the most popular form of music in the world, period. Yes. So, you know, Europe has a special place in my heart. Whenever we go there, we get crazy love. We feel it. South America, like, it'd be hard for me to pick one place to say that's the joint. Because mm -hmm. there's so much love for this everywhere we go. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it literally inspires me. I'm going to be honest, it inspires me more than living in New York does, man. Because the York has changed so much the music. But the style of music that, that I love, the style of hip-hop I love, I feel like it's being carried and appreciated on a higher level in foreign places, mm. and uh, which is sad, but also a beautiful thing too, you know. Yes, yes, it is. It is. It is. It is definitely a sad situation because just you know, again, you seem to be a humble guy, so I'm gonna speak for you. You one of the dopest producers I've heard in a very long time. You know, again, I go back Port Authority and all those joints, right? Thank you. But it's it. Like you said, it's a sad, it's, it's, it's duality, right? That's it's the ultimate duality. Um, it's like, damn, I got to go to Canada to get one of the dopest MC, I mean, dope, dopest producers. But, damn, one of the dopest producers in the world comes from Canada. My culture is touching everything because, like, I, I'm taking from Nori. Nori says hip-hop is, is a race upon itself. I totally agree with that. We are a different breed of cat. We are... A whole community because the things that you were touching on, those things touched me in the same way. We never met each other, but we have the exact same mindset. We feel in the same way about Dilla. the homie who's in my chat room right now, RC. You touching him, and that's the whole beauty of hip hop. I'm gonna rephrase, I'm gonna repackage that question and say, what was the most surprising place? What was the place that surprised you the most? in regards to embracing hip hop the way they did? Um Chile. Probably Santiago Chile was crazy. We 
packed mm. on a place in eight days, like a thousand people. It was like a volcano in that place. Mm-hmm. It really made me realize, like, the music is bigger than any of us. Like, how it reaches people and, and touches people's lives. It was crazy. Yeah, man. It, you know, like, 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 like you're saying, I'm listening to Little Brother. You hear Fonte speak about people mouthing your words and they don't even speak English and they're singing your joints. They're rocking to your joints, which is insane to me. It's dope. Yep. Let's go back to Canada and get get it get it more into Marco Polo. Marco Polo gets bit by this hip hop bug. But the day before he got bit, what was he doing? Can you repeat the question? Sorry, though. The connection's a little shaky. Okay. Marco Polo is in uh, Toronto, Canada. The day before he get, gets bit by the hip hop bug, what was Marco Polo's life like? Oh, okay, great question. So before, so shout out to my father, rest in peace to my dad. Um, he was really, rest really, in peace. I would say a music head, and, and he put me on all types of music. He's actually the one that kind of probably influenced me to get into to hip hop because. He was oh. listening to jazz, like John Coltrane, kind of blue, and then rock and roll, mm. Italian music, because that's my my, my bloodline. Mm-hmm. And he bought he bought Trap's first album, no second album, mm-hmm. no mm-hmm. first album, first album because he liked Apple Applebaum. That was his joint, so he mm. bought that album. Oh. That was the first hip hop record in my in my album in, in the house. So I started you know tickling my ear and gaining some interest. But yeah, man, I was just a kid in high school, like just figuring out my life. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right, so, right. I don't, but I was listening all the time. I lived in the suburbs, so I was listening to rock shit too, like Nirvana and, and Soundgarden and all types of stuff. So, um, That's dope. you know, and then I locked in to hip hop, and that became like the thing that was I was most, you know, gravitated towards at the end of the day. So, you know. What would you, how would you label your style? I'm a very heavy drum driven producer mm-hmm. uh, because that's how I look at my father. Mm. That's, how, that's what I call them. I call them my, my hip hop dads, like Primo. And I think big drums is a big part of my sound because I grew up listening to music that had super heavy drums. So the first thing I'm always focused on with my beats is how the drums are sounding. So I would say I'm a very drum driven guy. And then. Uh, you know, I'm still a fan of, of heavy bass lines, and I can go melodic, I can go something that's just, you know, uh, grimy. I just, I really feel like it depends on my emotion day to day, how I'm feeling. Now that I'm rocking with Ace, I'm making less straight hardcore stuff like I was, per se, on my solo albums or with 4 Ace, and Ace is definitely a more conceptual artist where it's very topical and emotional, so he likes to write you know, topic stuff. So that requires a certain type of beat. And he kind of opened up a whole new chamber. And uh, it was kind of a challenge for me. So sorry if you hear noise in the background, but the oh. partying and celebrating Joe Biden's win right now. Right, right. I'm already knowing. I, I, I kind of figured that the whole world is celebrating. What, uh, uh, well, not the whole world. All of America, all of the good people in America, uh, is, they're celebrating. Right. Speaking of conceptual, conceptual albums, you and Ace last pro- project, if I'm not mistaken, is the Brook- uh, Brooklyn story. It's kind of like your life story. How did you guys determine? Uh, what 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 brought you you guys to that point? He, I mean, that that was his vision. Mm. I would have never, I would have never in a million years said, "Hey, hey, Ace, let's make the album about my life." Like, <laughs> 100%. A hundred, I'm too, I'm not that dude, like, I'm, a, you know, like I said, I have my moments, but I would have never been grandiose to be like, let's do that, like, that was 100% his idea, it was extremely humbling, and, and really dope for him to want to do that, and uh, it provided an opportunity for me to actually include a lot of people in my life on the record and, and tell the story, there's a, there's a bit of, there's a bit of fiction in some of the skits, but overall, it's a pretty accurate uh, tale of, of, you know, the move and, and moving to New York from Toronto and the things that happened. So it was very dope for him to, to suggest that. I'll always be grateful for that. Man, that was that was that's, that is definitely a dope concept. I'm glad you did it because I, 
you know what? It makes me ask this question. I've asked this to you. I'm going to ask it to you. I've asked it to Mr. Walton. I asked it to other producers I've had on.